All right. Thanks so much for um, for tuning in. Uh, we are here on. We're doing a weird sort of simulcast, both on Spreaker, um, which is sh- was shipping out to iHeartRadio, and here on Blog Talk Radio, going to Google Podcasts and the like. So, um, if it seems a little still to start with, I'm doing the very best I can. This is a super important topic. All right, here we bringing in our Blog Talk Radio audience. All right, Blog Talk Radio, thank you ever so much. We appreciate you being here. Blog Talk Radio on Google Podcasts, Real Talk, and on iHeartRadio, to the heart of the matter. Thank you ever so much for showing up tonight. This is, a, I think, one of the, you know, I, normally I try to avoid these topics because it seems, you know, it seems, you know, as, as a radio host, it seems almost, almost too easy. It seems almost too easy, but I think I've done uh, myself and I think I've done the nation a disservice by not speaking on these topics more often, frankly. Uh, Because you know what? When I was in college, you know what? I was was a Democrat at Florida State University, and I guess I was liberal in the the sense where, you know what? Or maybe I just didn't know a whole bunch. Uh, Maybe a little bit of both. I once told somebody, if you were against abortion, don't have one. And I thought that that was just the best advice ever. I thought that I had solved the problem. I really did. You know, I was, I've, I've always been sort of a cocky son of a bitch, I guess. Uh, and I really thought that I had solved the problem. If you if, if you're against abortion, don't have one. See, that solves the problem. That, you know, cuts down on a number of abortions and then you don't have to have one. There you go. Um, but leave everybody else alone, uh, which seems to be sort of a uh, uh, maybe a libertarian slant, except when you figure in this part. When you go to the abortion clinic and you kill the growing human being inside you, you've committed murder. And not even libertarians want murder because that's what it is. It's murder. Why? Because that life inside you was never going to be anything else. It was never going to be a puppy. It was never going to be a tree. It was never going to be a succulent. It was never going to be anything else than a human being. Although it may not be a fully developed human being, it's it's a human being. You know, and I, you know, as I got older is when I got smarter. I got smarter and I started looking at, at science. You know what? A lot of times the left will tell people on the right that they are science deniers or whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, so let's look at the science of this. The science is that we are finding out that at a earlier and earlier date, the baby can sense external stimulus. Earlier and earlier. That things that are, that are happening in utero are having a larger effect, have a much larger effect on the baby than we thought ever than we thought ever, for the good and the bad. You know, for years, science, doctors, medical people have, have, have said to women, do not, once you find out you are pregnant, do not drink alcohol. Because what, if, what are we learning? That the, that the baby will get what they call fetal alcohol syndrome, and that's a bad thing. So is it such a bad, I mean, is it a bad thing? If there is a life inside you that can develop a syndrome because of the acts that, uh, that, that the mother commits, like something like having wine or having beer or, or you know what, or hit, you know, or, or having two, two or three fingers of, of tequila every night, then how can anybody say that that's not a life? How can you make the, 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 the mental jump the, to, to do the, the intellectual gymnastics it takes um, to call that which is inside the woman at that point n- not life, something other than life. How can you do the mental gymnastics that it takes to, to hop there if indeed, now we're finding, here's what else we're finding out. We're finding out and we're being able to do earlier and earlier um, that there is there are surgeries that are that can be done 
on these babies while they're in utero, while they're in the woman's body. Lives can be saved. So, if again, if 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 these are some sort of massive blob of tissue, like you know, like a boil on your ass, then uh, then how and why would you? Why, why would science go through all the trouble? Why would science? Why would the medical profession, that a lot of you seem to just think hang the moon, the same people who thought bloodletting was a good idea to to you know ease disease. Anyway, um, why do you think suddenly that this is that these people who have who are going through all these all these incredible means by which to preserve life and to save life in utero are now they're wrong these that this is not life at all. I don't understand how you get there. You know what I I, I know that people are lazy. Um, and don't want to think about such things. I, I I've learned in my fifty eight years that people just want to do where whatever the heck they want to do. They don't want consequences. They don't want to have to deal with it. I you know what? And I'm almost and I'm almost anathema to any of that because I understand. I understand people just want to do whatever the hell they want to do. They do. That's the nature of people, and that's the nature of people in the twentieth century, really. They just want to be able to do whatever they want to be able to do, whenever they want to be able to do it, without consequences. They just want to be able to live free and do whatever they want to do. Right? Am I correct? Of course I am, because that's what folks want to do. Consequences is not what anybody really wants, anybody want to deal with. People don't want their lives interrupted. They want to be able to have sex whenever they want, however they want, with whomever they want. Because somehow people have taken on the uh, on the viewpoint that that is their right, that they have a right to that. They have a right to basically anything they want without consequence. I understand that people are like that. And I think that when it comes down to it, this is what we're talking. This is really what we're talking about. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the claims that people make, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the numbers, because the numbers always tell the story, don't they? When we're having these discussions about abortion and who, and, and how much how many abortions are you know are, are, are you know people get and who gets these abortions. Um, we always have these anecdotal stories because you know what I know a girl. Dot, 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 right? You know, and, and, and we, all have, we always have these what-if scenarios. What if the girl is raped by her father? So you got, wow, you got rape and incest in, in the same set of bullcrap. Nice. So let's, we're going to talk about all, we're going to talk about all those numbers and how often these things actually happen. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that, that, that often end up being um, false claims. Um, that first claim that nobody knows when life begins. You know? Well, the fact of the matter is that every new life be- begins at conception. This is, um, you know what, this is off the abort73.com website. Yes, and I know people are going to say that, well, you're not trying to look at this fairly. No, because I don't believe there's another side to this. There's no debate here. I even I even entitled my blog talk radio program "Abortion is Murder." Dash no calls, no debate. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm here to first of all, I'm I, I, I'm here tonight to encourage those who are like believers in this, who, who who are like thinkers in this, and I'm here to tell some of you other people that you're being lied to. You're being lied to. You're being lied to. We are. We are going very quickly down into a place as a nation where we don't want to be. So every, you know what? So every new life begins. Every new life begins at conception. This is an irrefutable fact of biology. Again, these are the same damn people who call who, who call people who who don't buy into the whole climate change nonsense 
um, science deniers. These, this is biology. This is the science that you keep saying is, is, is the new religion. This is the science. It is true for animals. It is true for humans. When considered alongside the law of biogenesis, that every species re reproduces after its own, we can only draw one conclusion in regard to abortion. And I said this, I said this just a few minutes ago. The, 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 the two humans get together, two human beings, one male, one female get together, have, have sexual intercourse. Um, the, the male um, ejaculates sperm into the woman. The sperm ends up into the egg, a zygote, bang. That's only going to be a baby. Again, by the law of biogenesis that every species re reproduces after its own kind, we can, only, we can only draw one conclusion in regard to abortion. No matter what the circumstances of conception, no matter how far along the pregnancy, abortion always ends the life of an individual human being. Every honest abortion advocate concedes this simple fact. Faye Walton, uh, the longest uh, reigning president and the largest abortion business in the United States, Planned Parenthood, argues as far back as 1997 that everyone already knows that abortion kills. See, they're not, at this point, not even trying. This is the, this is the part that we really have to start getting and really have to start acting on. We're not, that, we're not even having an argument anymore. Again, Faye Waddleson um, argues, I mean, as far back as 1997, that, that everybody already knows that abortion kills. Everybody already knows that. She proclaims the following in an interview uh, with Ms. Magazine. Uh, I think that we have deluded ourselves in believing that people don't know that abortion is killing. So any pretense pre that abortion is not killing is a signal of our ambivalence, a signal that we cannot say, yes, it kills a fetus, baby. On the other side of the pond, Anne, Anne Fioretti, um, the chief executive of the largest independent abortion business in the UK, said in this 2008 debate, we can accept that an embryo is a living thing in the fact that it has a beating heart and that it has its own genetic system within it. It's clearly human in the sense that it is not a gerbil. We can recognize that it's a human life. Okay, these two women, isn't it crazy that it's women? These two women have said, yes, I know that we are killing a human. Naomi Wolf, prominent feminist author and abortion supporter, makes similar concessions that she writes, uh, clinging to the rhetoric about abortion in which there is no life and no death, we entangle our beliefs into a series of self-delusions, um, fibs, and evasions, and we risk becoming precisely what our critics charge us with being callous, selfish, and casually destructive, men and women who share a cheapened view of human life, which they do. Uh, we need to contextualize the fight to defend abortion rights, what the right to be able to, according to Anne Shuridi and um, Faye Waddleson, to kill a human being. We need to contextualize the fight to defend abortion rights within a moral framework that admits that the death of a fetus is a real death. So this woman, Amy Wolf, is saying... I mean, we are just, they're just out there with it now. But what, what she's saying is that we need to find a way to, to have this argument, to have this discussion and say, yes, I know we're killing a baby, but are you kidding me? David Boonin, in his book, The Defense of Abortion, makes this startling admission. In the top drawer of my desk, I keep a picture of my son. The picture was taken on September 7, 1991, 24 weeks before he was born. The sonogram image is murky, but it reveals clear enough a small head tilted back slightly and an arm raised up and bent, with a hand pointing back towards his face and a thumb extended out towards his mouth. There is no doubt in my mind in this picture, uh, I mean, that this picture too shows my son at the very early stage of his physical development, and there is no question that the position... I defend in this book entails that it would have been morally permissible to end his life at this point. 
So this person, David Boone, in his, in his book, The Defense of Abortion, says, you know what? I saw the sonogram of my son. He was sucking his thumb. But I have, but, it, but he believes that it's morally permissible to kill that baby, his son. These are the people that we are dealing with. Now, I'm going to read a couple more because this is, this is so fundamental to the importance of what we're dealing with and the kind of people that we're dealing with. Um, Bernard, uh, Bernard Nathanson co-founded one of the most influential abortion advocacy groups in the world, um, NARAL, N-A-R-A-L, uh, and once served as the medical director for the largest abortion clinic in America in 1974, he wrote an article for the New, New England Journal of Medicine in which he states, there is no, no longer serious doubt in my mind that human life exists within the womb from the very first onset of pregnancy. Some years later, some years later he would reiterate, there's simply no doubt that even early embryo uh, even the early embryo of a human uh, is a human being. All this genetic coding and all the features are indisputably human. As to being, there is no doubt about it, it exists. It is alive. It is, it, it is, excuse me, is self-directed and is not the same being as the mother. And therefore is ununified. There is therefore a unified whole. So the idea that it is the woman's body is a false idea. Even this guy will admit there is no doubt that it exists, is alive, is self-directed, and is not the same being as the mother. It's not the same. It's not the same being. It's not the same. It's not like chopping your arm off, although you can't get a doctor that's worth his salt that won't get sued. If, if you go to him and say, you know what, doctor, I have the right, I don't want a right arm. I think you should chop it off. I need you to chop it off. You have to search far and wide. You have to go to a foreign country to get that to happen because no one will do it here in this country. No one will do it here in this country. We often go back to the, I, I'm a musician, I'm a saxophone player by, by trade. And I always go back to the original intent of everything. I always go back to the original intent of the saxophone which is not a jazz instrument, but jazz instrument, by the way, it happens to be a orchestral instrument designed to be a strong woodwind voice in the orchestra. Um, so I always go, that, that's free, but I always go back to the original intent and stuff. And you want to go back to the original intent of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood was developed by a lady, founded by a lady, called, uh, her name was Margaret Sanger. You might have heard of her. Um, so she was first a birth control pioneer. Um, publicly condemned abortion. First of all, she publicly condemned abortion and called it dangerous and vicious because it was, especially at the time, in attempting to distance contraception from abortion. Uh, she wrote in 1932, no new life begins unless there is conception. In other words, Sanger knew that life begins at conception and she knew that abortion entails the killing of babies. And it wasn't that she was against the killing of babies. The idea was that she didn't think that it would be palatable to the people that she was trying to control. Despite overwhelming consensus in regard to life beginning, uh, uh, to life's beginning, Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 verdict was, which legalized abortion in the United States, is actually built on the claim that there is no way to say for certain whether or not abortion kills because no one can say for certain when life begins. Just as Harry Blackman, who authored the majority opinion, wrote, the judiciary at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in a position to resolve the difficult question of when life begins. Since those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology aren't unable to arrive at any consensus. Well, you know what? Here's the deal. Uh, just as Harry Blackman is full of crap because, you know what? You don't need philosophy or even theology. All you need is biology. All you need to go back is to the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis. Justin Black, just, Justice Blackman's assertion is a ridiculous one, or at least as it applies to the field of medicine, Dr. Nathanson had this to say about ruling. 
Uh, of course, I was pleased with Justice Harry, Harry Blackman's abortion decision, which was unbelievably sweeping triumph for our cause, far broader than our 1970 victory in, in New York or the advance since then. I was pleased with Blackman's conclusions that, that is, I could not plumb the ethical or medical reason that had produced the conclusions. Our final victory has propped up at, or on a misreading of obstetrics, gynecology, embryology, and that's a very dangerous way to win. <clears throat> so, um, this doctor, Dr. Nathanson, knew that this was nonsense. He was like, I sort of, yeah, you know what, sort of misread the whole science thing. Obstetrics, gynecology, embryology, it's kind of a dangerous way to win because because you know what, and I thought for and I've thought forever. I'm gonna take a a, a, a breath here. I've I, I I thought forever that 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 this was going to be settled law and there wasn't much we can do about it. But it seems like you know what now, like I mentioned earlier, we have more and more ways, more and more ways to figure out the, some of the things that they thought they couldn't figure out. We have technology, medical technology, to figure out that, wait a minute, wait, stop, wait, wait, wait. When are we interdicting into these child's lives? How can they feel pain? Can they feel pain at 24 weeks? Oh, for those of you who didn't know, the gestation period for human beings is 36 weeks. Um, or 40, or, you know, 36, 40 weeks. But can can they feel pain? The the theological and the philosophical question is: When do we become we? When do we become us? And I don't think that's an important question, really, in the sense that we will never become us if you murder us. Dr. Nathanson would eventually abandon his support for elective abortion and note that the basics of prenatal development were well known to human embryology at the time when the U.S. Supreme Court issued its 1973 ruling, even though the rulings made no use of them. So um, Dr. Nathanson, who had been a supporter of abortion, knew, he knew that it was crap. He knew that it was a lie. He knew that it was bullcrap from the from from the from jump, right? In biological terms, life begins, and life's beginning is a settled fact. You know how they like how, 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 how to say this is settled law. This is I mean, there's nothing you can do. This is settled law. Why are we even talking about this, right? The settled fact is that life begins at conception. That's the fact. No matter how inconvenient that is for you, that is the fact. It doesn't get any more factual than that. Life begins at conception. That's all there is to it. And they, you know what, and they knew this. The Supreme Court knew this. They just didn't use, and the, 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 the science was there. It just didn't get used. In biological terms, life begins, life's beginning is a simple fact. Individual human life begins at fertilization, and there is all sorts of authoritative public resources to prove this. Consider the evidence I'm going to I'm, I'm going to bring to you um, right now. Modern teaching on um, modern teaching text on embryology. This is from um, Keith Elmore, the, de the developing human, clinically oriented embryology, tenth edition, uh, Philadelphia, PA, uh, Elfern, 2006. This is 2016. The Kindle locations are 739 and 1094. Human development begins with fertilization approximately 14 days after the onset of the last menstrual period, when a sperm fuses with the on-site to form a single cell, um, the zygote. The, the highly specialized um, T-potent cell marks the beginning of each of us as an as a unique individual, not a part of the mother. So you can say, this is part of me, my, my body, my choice, except now you've got two bodies in you, and one of them is you, and one of them isn't. 
one of those bizarre, weird um, things about humans or about birth, about nature. Yeah, you got one or two people in there that ain't you. That's somebody else. And this is from T.W. Sadler's uh, Lagman's Medical Embryology, 13th edition, uh, Philadelphia, PA. Uh, this is from Walter's Clover. This was published in 19, excuse me, in 2015. This is just four years ago. All from page 14. Development begins with fertilization, the process which the male gamete and sperm, the sperm, and the female gamete, the, un, the oncite or the egg, unite to give rise to a zygote. This marks, and this is from the first book, The Develop, Developing Human, this marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. This is from Keith L. Moore, Before We Are Born, Essentials in Embryology, 9th edition, Philadelphia, PA. Um, you can find it on Kindle at 555. Its publishing date is 2008. Human development begins at fertilization when an ovum from the female is fertilized by a sperm from the male. And there are others. There are a bunch of others. In 1981, um, the United States Judiciary Subcommittee received the following testimony from a collection of medical experts. This is this with the Subcommittee on Separation of Powers um, to Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, Senate 158 report, uh, this is the 97th Congress, first session back in 1981. It is incorrect to say that biological data cannot be decisive. It is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception. This is from Professor um, Micheline Matthews Roth from Harvard University Medical School. I, this is from Alfred um, Wajanini. Uh, professor of Pediatrics and Obstetrics from the University of Pennsylvania. I have learned from my earliest medical education that human life begins at the time of conception. This is from um, um, Jerome Lejeune, Professor of Genetics from the University of um, Descartes. Yes. Uh, After fertilization has taken place, a new human being, a new human being has come into being. It is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It is plain Exper- you know what? Uh, uh, experimental evidence. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. From Professor Jaime Gordon from the Mayo Clinic. By all criteria of modern molecular biology, life is present from the moment of conception. This is from Dr. Watson Bowes from the University of Colorado Med- Medical School. The de- the beginning of a single human life from a biological point of view is simple and straightforward matter. The beginning is conception. The official Senate report reached this conclusion. This is 1981. Physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of life of a human being. A being that is alive and a member of the human species. There is overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. The AMA declared as far back as 1857, referenced in, in Roe v. Wade, um, opinion that the that the independent and actual existence of a child before birth as a living being is a matter of, uh, of objective science. They deplored the popular ignorance that the fetus is not alive until after the period of, of, of quickening. Folks, and I went through all of that to encourage you in the sense that there is an awful lot of evidence, scientific evidence that you can use in the discussions that you have. And some of us are going to end up in discussions with state legislators. Uh, We're going to end up in discussions with clergy, which, which blows my mind. And here's what you, and and in, in all that, here's what you haven't had to do. You haven't had to crack your Bible open, have you? Because that's what they're going to say. You're going to say, well, you're just some sort of Bible-thumping, la 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 You haven't had to crack your Bible one time. You use the very science that they're so in love with uh, when they're talking about um, climate change. Use the very same science, 
right? Now, here's the deal. Um, let's let's talk about it's you know about halfway through. Let's talk about who gets these abortions because the numbers oftentimes tell the stories. Now, not every state produces numbers. Um, now, some of them say it's because of privacy. It seems silly to think that you can't count these these procedures up and leave the names and you know the names uh, out, the names and faces out. Um, but sometimes they just don't want you to know. In 2014, approximately 19 percent of the of U.S. pregnancies, excluding spot excluding spontaneous miscarriages, ended in abortion. 19 percent of U.S. pregnancies ended in abortions. Nearly 20% or one-fifth of pregnancies in, in the United States, nearly one-fifth of those babies, those pregnancies, probably at least one-fifth or more of those children were murdered. According to the United Nations 2013 report, only nine countries in the world have a higher reported abortion rate in the United States. You want to hear where they are? They're great places, great places of like the vacation. Places like... Bulgaria, Cuba, Estonia, Georgia, not Georgia like Georgia where Atlanta is, but Georgia like in Russia, Kazakhstan, Romania, Russia, Sweden, and the Ukraine. Right? Okay, now the UN, can't really go by them, I guess. The UN um, lists China's official abortion rate at 19.2%. China, China's actual abortion rate is likely much higher, according to the, 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 the China's 2010 census. There were approximately 310 million women of re- reproductive age in the country. An estimated 13 to 23 million abortions happen annually in China, resulting in an adjusted abortion, adjusted abortion rate of 40 1.9%. The abortion rate um, is the number of abortions per thousand women ages from 15 to, four, to 44. There is genocide happening in China. In 2014, the highest percentage rate of pregnancies were, were aborted in, in here in the States in the District of Columbia, predominantly black, was 38%. In New York, 33%. In New Jersey, right next door, 30%. The lowest rates, however, were in places like Utah. The Mormons don't kill their kids. South Dakota, there aren't any people. Uh, Wyoming, there are fewer people. Less than 2% in Wyoming. In 2015, approximately 35% of all pregnancies in New York, excluding spontaneous miscarriages, ended in abortion. 30 Five percent of pregnancies in an abortions in New York. So is it? So, what, so is it necessary? So that that leads the question: What was the necessity of the bill? Just the, the measure that's passed in New York that could potentially allow an abortion up until the day the child is born. What was his necessity? Do they want to, I mean, and it was cheered in the state house. And people were clapping and hugging and crying like they, everybody had won the lotto that they were saying everybody's going to get paid $1,000 a week just because. I mean, are you kidding me? Already 35% of all pregnancies in New York, excluding spontaneous miscarriages, in, a, in an abortion. And that's according to the, to the CDC. To the Center for Disease Control. I always, I always want to say, and this is an aside, when I see CDC, I always want to think Control Data Corporation. And those of you who are, you know, who are computer nerds know what I'm talking about. Especially computer nerds from the 80s. The annual number of legal induced abortion in the United States doubled between 1973 and 1979. Obviously, it was a new trendy thing to do. And peaked in 1990. Theirs was a slow... It was a slow but steady decline through the 90s. Overall, 
the annual abortion a, annual abortions have decreased by six percent between 2000 uh, and 2009, with a temporary spikes in 2002 and 2006. That's according to the, the Center for Disease Control. From 2014 to 15, the number, um, rate, and ratio of reported abortions all decreased by two percent. Now again, all that's not according to me. It's not according to 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 Trump. It's it's according to the to the Center for Disease Control. Now let's talk about who has abortions, because this is abortions are being protected because of the people who are having them. This is a voting block. In 2015, unmarried women accounted for 86 percent of all abortions, and these facts and these numbers are all from the Center for Disease Control. So you could you could fight them if you want to, but don't fight me over them. Don't fight me over them because guess what? I didn't make them up. Okay, unmarried women, uh, only four percent of pregnancies. In the, in the in the in the boy excuse me among married women only four percent of pregnancies currently in in abortion so this isn't <coughs> these aren't married women these are unmarried women having these abortions for basically whatever reason uh, women in their twenties accounted for the majority of abortions in 2015 and had the highest abortion have the highest abortion rates adolescents under 15. See, and this is one of the things they say, right? It's one of the things they, they push. What about these really young children that are, you know what, that are raped by their parent, you know, raped by, you know what, a, a family member or something? Well, I'll tell you. Um, adolescents under 15 obtained 0.03% of all abor- of 19, 2015 abortions. Women, I mean, which is none. 0.03% is none. That's statistically zero. It doesn't happen. So, the, so according to the CDC in in, in 2015, basically, all, no women, no females under 15 years old had abortions. Almost none. 0.03%? 0.03%? Nothing. In 2015. Uh, in 2015, according to the CDC, um, between 15 and 19, 9.8%. Between 20 and 24, 31.1%. Uh, between 25 and 29, 27.6%. Between 30 and 34, 17.7%. 35 and 39, 10%. And f- 40 years and older, 3.5%. So what we're talking about is that group between 20 and 29, the 20 year olds, the 20 year olds account for 58.7% of abortions. They're a voting block, which is why the, um, the push to expand vote, uh, to expand, uh, abortion. Because once they get to 30, mm, only about 17% are interested. Because I think once you get to 30, I mean, you, you also have fewer pregnancies as well. Uh, and 35, even fewer pregnancies. And, 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 and 40 and older, even, few, even fewer pregnancies, obviously. Women living with a partner to whom they are not married account for 25% of abortions. But those women, but, the, but those are only about 10% of the women in the population. Let me explain this to you. 10% of the population are people who are living with somebody they're not married to. So when somebody tells you, well, everybody's living together, no, they're not. Only about 10% of people, or women are doing that, or living with someone they're not married to. But they're having a quarter of the abortions. This gets back to my original, that my original thought that people are people want to live in a way that they can do whatever they want to, whenever they want to, however they they wish. That they can live an amoral life with no 
consequences. This gets back, and the and you know what, and, and you can be mad at me, but the data proves what I'm saying. The number, the science that the left is so in love with, proves what I'm saying is correct. In 2015, women who had not had aborted, excuse me, in 2015, women women who had not aborted in the past accounted for 56 percent of all abortions. So in 2015. Uh, all the new, I mean, there were 56% of, of abortions where people who had never done it before. Okay. Women with one uh, or two, pri- two, one or two prior abortions accounted for 35%. And women with, with three or three or more abortions uh, accounted for 8%. And that's also a CDC number. So what we have to do on the pro-life side, side is stop saying, because, you know, we got to say, you got to walk in inaccuracy here. In order to prove your point, that people are using, that more and more people are using abortion as birth control when the numbers don't say that. I'll read this again. The numbers don't say that at all. In 2015, women who had not had, a, uh, who had not, excuse me, aborted in the past accounted for 56% of all abortions, more than half, had never had an abortion in 2015. Uh, women that have um, had one, one or two accounted for 35%, which is just awful. You've already had two abortions, and now you're having a third one. You've killed two or one or two kids, and now you're killing a third one. Yeah, that makes you a mass murderer. Um, and, 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 and the 8% of women who have, who have had three or more. Three or, or more? Yes. Them women are using this like birth control. Only about 8%, though. Not that that is... Not murder, and not that it that is not reprehensible and and horrific, but let's get our facts straight when we when we start having these discussions. Among women who have obtained abortions in 2015, 41 percent had no prior live births; they have never had kids before. Almost half, 45 percent had one or two live births. So some of these women have had, had children already. Okay, and 14 percent had three or more. They've had, they got three kids already and they decided, eh, well, you know what? I'm, yeah, I, I'm going to have three, but I ain't have four. Kill the fourth one. And I can and, and why do I keep saying that? Because some people are like, the guy like, well, you wouldn't say kill because it's not killing. Well, you know, we just look at the damn science. It most certainly is. Doctors believe it's killing. People who are embryologists believe it's killing. Uh, gynecologists um, believe it's killing. Even people who are uh, abortion advocates believe that it's killing. So stop saying, uh, well, it's not killing. Well, it most certainly is. Now here's, here's where the the rubber meets the road, my friends. Among white women, 10% of pregnancies currently in an abortion among white women, 10% of, abortion, of pregnancies currently in, in abortion. This, this is, again, a number from, from the CDC. Among black women, who are somewhere between 11 and 13%, well, black people are 11 or 13% of the population. Black women are somewhere between 7 or 8%. Of the, po- uh, uh, of, of the total population, 28% of pregnancies in, in an abortion. Now, that's CDC numbers. That's not my number. That's CDC numbers. That CD- Thanks, Mike. Um, that's CDC numbers. Now, I've decided... Now, I normally... Now, I'm, 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 I'm going to take a second if that's okay. I normally take calls and talk to people. But you know what? This is one of those subjects, frankly, where you can end up like Tar Baby. And I said that just like I meant it, where you end up wrestling with people over stuff that, you know what? I'm just telling you, there ain't no other side to this. There ain't no other side to this. Even abortion advocates 
or admit out loud that there ain't no other side of this. This is killing of a human being. The abortion rate of non-metropolitan women is about half of those who live in, metro, in, in, in metropolitan um, countries or counties. So city women get twice as many abortions as country women. Does it have something to do with the societal pressures of living in the cities? Does it have something to do with the uh, with, with the culture, with the with the societal culture, the political culture, the economic culture? It has something to do with all that. The abortion rate of women uh, with Medicaid coverage is three times as high as that of other women. Stop. 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 Let's combine these two things. Let's let's start thinking big. Black women, according to the the um, I keep thinking control data corporation, uh, according to the Center for Disease Control, say black women, twenty eight percent of pregnancies end in abortion. Now black women are somewhere between probably seven and eight percent of the population of the nation. How some somehow get twenty eight percent, twenty eight percent of pregnancies in an abortion sounds like freaking genocide to me. But that's for another discussion, which we will have. If you combine that with the abortion rate of women on Medicaid coverage, Medicaid what's Medicaid coverage? Medicaid coverage is is government sponsored health care for people who are poor. Not all black women are poor. Let's stop that nonsense. Not all black people are poor. Not all black people are on welfare. Not all black people are on food stamps. Not all black people are even on Medicaid. Let's stop that nonsense. But you can, you can put these things together and it is, you don't have to go through the, the mental gymnastics to go, hmm, small percentage of population, over, over a quarter of the abortions, and a good number of them are on public assistance, and a good number of them might even be on Medicaid. And they account, I mean, and those on Medicaid, uh, Medicaid coverage, three times as high as that as other people, as other women. Three times? If you're on Medicaid, which means that you have a way to afford it, which means that the government is going to sign the check to the abortion provider? Huh. Does, does that make does, does, does that make you think a little bit? That doesn't make you think a little bit? That doesn't that doesn't make you scratch your head a little bit? No? Then what the hell is wrong with you? All right. In 2014, 30% of, abort, of aborting women identified themselves as Protestant and 24 identified themselves as Catholic. Well, that's something, that's something that the church is going to have to deal with. The church has failed because the church is adopting the culture. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the church is, is, is not preparing people. The church has not been. I, I'm, I'm talk, I ain't talking about the Pope. I mean, I mean the Catholic Church has, has their own set of problems that have gotten the church itself off course. Um, so I, I'm not Catholic and I can't address the Catholic church. Um, so, so there you go. Now the good thing about um, that um, 30% of, of women who, ident who identified or self-identified as Protestant, what I've learned in my 58 years, especially in the past 30 years, not, not everybody who claims Christ is his. So, that doesn't bother me so much, but the, the church has failed. All right, let's talk about some other numbers. We're, we are running out of time. I've been running my mouth, and this is exactly why I didn't take any calls. Um, because I, I, I want to get as much of this stuff out as I possibly can. This is exactly why I didn't take any calls. Um, let's talk about who gets it, who gets abortions. Because a lot of times we talk about, well, we should make sure there are exceptions for rape and incest, Right? And uh, the health of the mother. In 2004, 
The Guttmeyer Institute anonymously surveyed 1,209 post-abortive women from nine different abortion clinics across the country. Of the women surveyed, 957 provided a main reason for having an abortion. This table lists the reason uh, of the percentage. Let's see. Rape. Less than 0.5% in this study. In this survey, less than 0.5. Fetal health problems, 3%. Physical health problems, 4%. 25% said not ready for a child. 23% said can't afford a baby. So 55% said can't afford a baby, can't, ain't ready for a baby. Plus you add 8% to that, 63%. Basically, well, let's, let's add these up. 8% said don't want to be a single mother. 7% said, not mature enough to raise a child, but you were mature enough to lay down there and have sex and get a baby. You're, you're, you're mature enough to throw that up there. Oh, my God. 4% said, you know, it's, it's going to mess with my education or career. So at least 4 plus 7 plus, plus 8 plus 19 plus... 23 plus 25 is it would be inconvenient. It would be inconvenient. It would, you know, it would mess with what I'm doing. Goes back to my original point. Ah, Consequences. But I am flat running out of time here. Boy, oh boy, I got eight minutes here. Um, Let's do some more. The, the state of Florida conducts re, uh, records reasons for every abortion that occurs within its borders. Each year, in 2015, there were 71,740 abortions here in my state of Florida. And we hear, what about rape and incest? In Florida, um, the pregnancy resulted from incest, from an incestual relationship was 0.001%. It never happened. What about in the, what about in, in the danger of the life of the mother? 0.065 percent pregnancies that that were endangering the life, the pregnancy of the mother. The woman was raped. 0.85 percent. Barely, barely a percent of those situations come into play. Almost none. The woman's physical health was threatened by the pregnancy. Point, point two eight eight percent. Point two eight, not even a percent. The woman's psychological health was threatened by the pregnancy. Her psychological health? She was going to go crazy. Even that was point two nine four percent. There was a serious fetal abnormality. That was only point six percent. The woman aborted for social or economic reasons is 6.2%. No reason, the elective, convenience, 92% out of convenience. Children were murdered. Let's get clear on all this. <clears throat> and I think that we're going to we're, we're going to slow it down. We're going to close here in a second. We only have about six minutes. Um, 89% of all abortions happen in the first trimester. 89% of the children are killed early because the idea is what? The idea is that they don't feel pain, that they're not really people then, they're not really babies then, when the fact of the matter is science says, yes, they are. In 2015, 8% of all abortions occurred between 14 and 20 weeks gestation, which, which got to tell you that, of course, these are children being murdered. 1.3% occurred um, greater than 20, 21 weeks or equal to 21 weeks. Between um, 6 weeks and 21 weeks, 
most happen between um, at seven weeks and eight weeks. But what we know is that life, according to science, not a co- not just according to the Bible. So don't throw that up in my face. Like, you well, you know, I'm all about it. But that's it's the science. It's your science that you hold in such high esteem. It's their science that they hold in such high esteem that is crushing their argument. That is pushing the argument to uh, choose life. It is, it is their own science that says, no, you're wrong. Life begins at conception. And if you tell somebody that tomorrow, they'll say, well, that's your opinion. And you go, it's the opinion of every medical professional and every medical school in the country. Right? And these are the same people who say, you know, the, pl- the planet's going through global warming or global climate change and we should do something. And you say, why? Because science says so. And, and you want know to say to them, stop killing babies through abortion. You know, babies. Well, science says so. Science. They're all glorious and important science says that these are children. These are babies. These are human beings that you are murdering. Even their advocates say there isn't any doubt that these are children. No doubt. The number of abortion providers declined between uh, by 3% between 2011 and 2014 from 1720 to 1671. Um, so we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We are getting there. You know, <clears throat> this is this is a deal. In 2011-2012, the average cost of a non-hospital abortion with local anesthesia at 10 weeks of gestation was 480 bucks. The average cost of a medical medical medication abortion up to nine weeks was five hundred and four dollars. There's money in it, and lots of money. Think about the number of abortions, and think about it at five hundred bucks a clip. Are you kidding? All right. Listen, uh, we got to get out of here, make room for somebody else. Thank you ever so much. Again, I was not going to take any calls. Uh, Mike, thanks for commenting on the Spreaker uh, page. I appreciate that, that you caught this live. Uh, you know, share this with your pro-life friends, please. Oh, and hell, share it with your with your pro-abortion um, baby-killing associates. Drop this off in every pro-murder chat room, uh, Facebook page you can find. Because the truth has got to be told. And the truth is on our side. The truth is truly on our side. So don't feel intimidated, folks. Don't feel like the culture is so big and the job is so big that, you know what, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. That's not true either. Because the enemy wants you to think that there's nothing that you can do. It's too big. That's simply not the truth. When you have truth, on, when you have truth, we have, tr- we have the truth on our side, we've got data on our side, we've got science on our side in these arguments, and there isn't, I mean, and this is observable, this isn't some climate change um, computer model stuff. This is obs- observable. This is the real science, which is the difference in climate change. Climate change is, is not ob- observable. It's not repeatable. Um, and and all these pr- projections are computer models. This is a real thing. We can look inside the woman and see the baby sucking his thumb. We got to get out of here. Again, until we see you again, go out there and learn something, love somebody, and for goodness sakes, y'all take care of yourself. 
Uh, we will see you when we see you. Peace.